is that we have to take this high degree of sports science, this high degree of strength and conditioning, you know, this high degree of assessing the neurological condition and make it as easy to do in six minutes, you know, for, for anybody. Hey, this is More Than Velocity. I'm Bart Pear here with Jordan Oseguera and Ryan Croton. And today we have a special guest with us, uh, David Meyer, who's coming in to kind of elaborate on injury and getting back from being injured to elite performance. Uh, we've had a couple podcasts on that before, but David's got some interesting insights that we really want, really want to dive into. Um, David is actually a, a doctor of physical therapy. He was the uh, medical and rehab coordinator for the St. Louis Cardinals down in a um, spring training facility for a while, still works with athletes and even has a, a book called injured to elite uh, on exactly what we're talking about, which is taking going from injury back to that level of performance that, um, you know, that we all would, would like to be at no matter what our potential is. So Ryan, I know you talked to David a lot in the past. So I'm going to let you kind of say hello to David. He can talk about a little bit of what he's doing and, and jump into it. Yeah, yeah. David and I have a common bond that we uh, we both work for the Cardinals, and um, uh, it's a really upstanding uh, organization. And uh, you know they're really cutting edge, and so he's been exposed to some things that I think a lot of teams have not. Um, and uh, he he's really uh, got a real universal approach to his return to performance programming because he does appreciate the cognitive aspects of athletes and, and their mental health. So um, I, I don't know, David, if you want to start and just kind of tell us a bit about your background, how'd you come to be, become a, a physical therapist and why baseball um, would be a great intro. Appreciate it, Ryan, Bart, Jordan. Thank all. I thank all of you to, for having me on here. Um, basically, let me start from the beginning. Then I grew up a diehard baseball fan and, avid ball player at five foot five, you don't get to play in the minor leagues, but I snuck into uh, community college baseball here in long Island actually played after getting my bachelor's degree in SUNY Albany. So they were a D one program. I tried out twice. I got like a second look one year. It wasn't happening. Played a little club there. Um, graduated in 07. So right before the financial crisis, my father, I grew up, he, he was sick. He had kidney disease. He got really sick that year. And if you remember back in 2006, our team, the Cardinals were playing my other team, the Mets. So I grew up a diehard Met fan here in New York and the Mets lost to the Cardinals in the NLCS. My father passed away a few months later in th on Thanksgiving of 2006. Before that, he tells me, look, the Mets aren't going to be the same for a while. He was like a baseball genius. And I, I mean, I remember taking my dorm room chair in Albany and chucking it across the room when Beltran went down on three a three pinch sequence uh, to Wayno and Yachty, and it was like a third call strike. I think it was a curveball. I was really upset. That was going to be the year. So, needless to say, after I mean, basically, I'm when I'm losing my father that that Thanksgiving, I'm vowing to my family like. I'm going to do whatever I can to, to make my dream come true, be around this game somehow. Of course, at that point, I kind of knew it wasn't going to be playing in any way. So I was pre-med and I didn't quite know if I wanted to become a physician, like a sports doctor, physician, or if I wanted to go on the rehab side. I had some ankle stuff. I did my own rehab and quickly determined that I was going to try and become the team physical therapist for the New York Mets. Uh, so you fast forward, I, I get my doctorate in physical therapy at NYU 2012, wet behind the ears. I start working in a place in Westchester, get a good end number of collegiate athletes. My first professional Tommy John player, minor league guy, like last round of the draft did terribly. I was, I was having a great time rehabbing him, but it went awful. He, uh, he didn't do well. He retour. I mean, a common situation for a lot of the players that especially are later in the draft, snuck in and I realized I needed to do more. So I applied to the hospital for special surgery, sports residency, went there, completed that halfway through kicking and screaming. Finally, they take me to city field. They're, they're the team doctors there for the Mets, Dr. Alchek. And I, 
I'm on the field. I felt like I made it. That was like my Rudy moment. It was the with the training staff. I meet David Wright. I, you know, I'm super man crush. And um, <laughs> yeah, and it was super close at that point. I'm like, all right, I'm here. I'm walking on City Field. I'm behind the turtle. Terry Collins is to my left. Like, all right, maybe I can get the job. And six months go by. I asked a few questions to a few really amazing mentors of mine, Pete Dreyevich, and the job opened. I applied. They fly me out to the winter meetings. I'm working for the Cardinals a few months later. That's that's the story. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. I know everybody has kind of a, a different path in in getting in uh, getting into Major League Baseball, but the passion is there. Yeah. So, so I guess you know I wanted to uh, to start in and and ask you a little bit about uh, throwing injury prevention and get a little bit of your, you know, your concepts in terms of what you think is ideal in terms of training um, and how you have, you know, potentially used uh, technology or even your subjective approach to monitoring throwing athletes. Yeah, it's interesting. When I was on my interview, I was talking about what we did at HSS and we used the biodex isokinetic testing for the shoulder, ER, IR ratios, all that stuff that is no longer sexy or, or new knowledge. And I talked about, let's integrate all this objective criteria. At HSS, actually, every place I went, everywhere was like, all right, Dave, you're interested in baseball. This is what we want to do. We want to determine what's the criteria to start throwing after surgery or injury, whatever. And every organization, institution seemed to really have this fascination with what is the objective criteria. And before working for the Cardinals, I was abreast of all the, the basic stuff. I found the studies on the hip range of motion and how that might be impacted, the ERIR ratios that Kevin Wilk and Mike Reinold have been so good at developing. But when it came to the higher level data, even some of the video and the mechanics, that stuff was just more of a subjective understanding I had. So my first my first year with the Cardinals, it was getting a feel for being a lover of the game and playing at some level to now I'm out there every single day throwing with at least five to 10 ball players that are probably, that have under, undergone Tommy John and understanding the art of throwing program development. And that was a really important piece because it was me getting the feel for what is it like for one player to get warmed up and loose versus another player to get loose. That meant such a different thing to, to each of those players. How far do they need to go in a long toss program for them to feel not only physically ready, but mentally ready? How important is a radar gun in terms of when they're making that jump back to simulated games and, and where's, where should their velocity be? A lot of it was mentorship from Adam Olson and the, and of course, Barry Weinberg and all the staff there. But slowly what happened after they brought in Robert Butler, the director of performance was they wanted to set the hallmark, the benchmark for major league baseball in terms of the, the whole side of, I guess they call it Moneyball 2.0, the whole side of collecting all this medical performance related data to create almost a scorecard for each player. So things started shifting to the performance mini camps and to getting catapult down there, getting the modus sleeve, and now looking at not just their shoulder range of motion, but looking at their entire movement assessment, their FMS, their SFMA, their Y balance, and then corroborating that now with players catapult load and looking at that on a computer screen with my colleague and then comparing that to their arm speed with the modus sleeve and starting to ask more questions about perhaps why one player was failing to launch or go forward in, in a program versus another player that that wasn't going that direction starting to really for lack of a better way of saying it fish and I was there during the fishing process. It was deep sea fishing with some, with some shiny objects. And I know now just looking at what driveline has done, just looking at how people are talking, talking about acute on chronic workload, how things have changed for me. I, I really do think that that is a massive step in the right direction 
as as far as looking at acute and chronic workload. And I think that's one piece that even then in 2015, if I, if we really had a, a further understanding then, I think that would have helped me with some of the program intervention or throwing program intervention. But for me, I just loved being out there throwing. I was the guy that was throwing maybe back to back to back to back. So for me, it was really getting immersed into tailoring a program for each ball player and they all wanted the program they wanted it written out for months but for me i i usually got them to understand that about a month or two in jordan i'm sure you you know this you want the whole program you go a month in you're like all right we're gonna have to take it week by week to some degree i get it i wanted to go quicker now i'm super sore maybe even had a small tear scar tissue whatever it is and the player would come in and you'd see their look on their face like i told you so look but i I mean, you don't want that. I mean, this is their livelihood. So it was a lot of the art the first year while slowly, while seeing the fishing going on. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, just I'll let Jordan speak more. But, you know, the one thing that I think was an advantage that you had is that you're out there watching the players move. And some of the things that I've seen just from my outside perspective looking in, and, and obviously I'll let Jordan talk a little bit more about his involvement in players and coming back from injury but I noticed that there's not a big change visually. You know, we didn't, ha- we didn't have high-end technology to look at um, mechanics, but it's interesting to see how strongly athletes adopt an injured uh, uh, movement pattern. You know, once they, once they have an injury, you know, it's kind of like they become invariable. And once they, you know, heal, and they go through the recovery process, it's almost as though they've retained this particular motor pattern. So I kind of will talk to Jordan about some of his experiences because um, it's been interesting working with athletes, not, not even just injured, but, you know, trying to reframe, you know, how they move, you know. Yeah, we had a we had a conversation, obviously, prior prior to getting him onto the podcast that was real eye-opening for me because he dealt a lot with obviously injured athletes and his line of work. It's something that I've helped with kind of throughout my entire coaching career and his perspective on it, specifically from the mental emotional aspect. And, you know, he touched on that a little bit of where he, this player doesn't quite feel ready. This player does, but now you're taking those, you know, a lot of times which are subjective, those, how that player's feeling from that mental emotional standpoint, then you're able to pair it with a lot of that information and that technology. And now you can dial in that throwing program a lot more specific to that player. Um, and, you know, we know some of the same guys. One of the guys that got brought up was, you know, Ryan Sheriff. Um, I dealt with Ryan when he was still in the minor leagues. And obviously, you know him from his time when he was in the big leagues and, you know, kind of dialing it up there with the Cardinals and everything on those ends. And that's a player that that mental emotional aspect is a lot more intense than most people out there. And that's why he's been able to be successful is because he's so much more intense that if you try to tell that player, he needs to fit into box a Mm -hmm. of the throwing program, even when he was coming back from his injuries, it's not going to be the same as his player that needs box B. So if you don't mind going in a little bit on that, I think you're going to do a lot more justice to it than I am um, from explaining that just because you're so much more hands-on with those guys. I mean, listen, when I talk about the play, I'm so glad you mentioned that piece to it, Robbie Rowland, he was the tail end with me before Robbie Rowland was Robbie, Rowland, you know, uh, Jaime Garcia, the end of his career. Bard, also a fantastic guy. Jaime's awesome. Jaime's a great guy. Um, really good to me. Bard, Bard was there right in the middle of all of it, really towards the end. I, because I love the game so much, I saw it. And I felt it like everybody has heard me tell the story of why I, the whole psychology side was I had a player that he was sitting on the training room table. He was super just low affect. He, his legs were crossed on the training room table. Seemed like something wasn't feeling great. He was about six months after his TJ and make a long story short. He, he attempted suicide and I felt really regretful that I didn't like do something more. So I, Being with the Cardinals, seeing the gamut, these players like Sheriff, Bard, and and fortunately or unfortunately getting really connected to them at a deeper level, friendship-wise, and getting to know what they were going through, especially Sheriff. I mean, Sheriff is is a good friend. It affected them so much. And you mentioned how 
uh, Ryan, you mentioned how it affects their movement patterns, almost that injured, it takes on its own persona. And it does because their identity is so connected to being a ball player. That's the whole phrase of you look good, you feel good, you feel good, you play good, you play good, you get paid good. That Mo told me my first year, funny enough. It's true. Their identity is around this. And Orion Sheriff, who's coming out of an injury or two, when he's working on his glute and his heel connection, and he's calling me up asking for Dave, give me the heel drill. Give me, a heel, you know, for Jordan, you could probably remember him doing this with you, right? And you know in your head, you're like, dude, throw the freaking ball. Go out there and throw the ball, please. You know, I, I always joke around when I was having a catch with a player and I was throwing the ball and I was hitting them hard and I, I could almost tell like they were deflated, their confidence wasn't there. And I was always kind of like, that's not good. I'm the alpha right, right here. I should never be the alpha, even early on in a program. I, I shouldn't really be the alpha. And even if they know that, they shouldn't be threatened or feel weird by that. So I could always sense like when the player's psyche was in a in that spot. Um, but the player really, to your point, Ryan, their movement was affected by their psychology, in my opinion. And I hate to be the person to bring it away from maybe the technology, but I have to say when they weren't coming from a place of love of the game, when they weren't coming from a place of play or, or playing the game, loving the game, you can you can do any SFMA. You could do any movement screen screen out there. If you're not getting to that piece to clean that up before they go out there with a the baseball again in their hand, their livelihood. I don't know how much even you know some of the heart rate variability stuff can tell you about that. Heart rate variability might tell you, all right, he had coffee, he's wired today. But does that does that device tell you, Johnny, is anxious about, or maybe anxiety, but overall sense of themselves. It doesn't tell you that. That's something that you know by being out there with them, like your point was, using your eyes and your ears and your senses and your human uh, qualities, and also empowering them, empowering them to to run with what, with what they can use to guide themselves in that off season, when they're at home, when they're not with you, when you got 15 other players there in the training room. You know, it's interesting you touch on an important part. I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about our platform is that there's a piece on subjective wellness, you know, and it's, it's really, you know, one of our designs is that we want to help clinicians and we want to help coaches be better remotely. You know, if you don't have all your, your athletes with you and on Jordan, he's, he's coaching a ton of athletes from all different levels, pro all the way down to the youth. And uh, it's tough to have those conversations. However, you know, the data is meant for you to check in. Now, like, you know, when a player is telling uh, on the app, telling us how they're feeling at a 10, you know, I don't suggest that the coach or the clinician um, goes to the player and says, hey, I noticed that, you know, you're a six out of 10 on your, you know, how your arm <laughs> feels, you know, right. that's, that's not the, the point of it. But like what you're talking about is like taking this data and having deep conversation. You know, you don't have to talk about the numbers, but you check in. Hey, how you feeling, man? How are things going? You know, see where see where they get to on their end. You know, and if the player, and so I see the benefit of the objective data and the subjective is if the player is really not feeling good and he's not telling you, you know, if it's not matching, you know, then you as the clinician or the coach, and it's great because you kind of seems like you're overseeing a lot of the throwing programming is that you can go and make the adjustment for them. You know, Hey, today we're going to throw, you know, we're going to throw it to 90 feet. I know we're supposed to go out to 150. you know, let's take it a little easier today and, uh, and, and give it a little bit more cover, you know, and the, you know, and that, and that's a conversation you go on and do it. You know, I just think about what you do and I know it's kind of funny, but I could never throw with an athlete that was returning from injury. Like I get the yips within 60 feet. So yeah, if yeah. these guys, you know, once they long out and I can throw it as far as possible and I can bounce it one time, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Am, I am money. I will not move a player. But when you're within that 60 feet, man, there's oh. something in my head and it's like, it gets to my fingertips. It's like, boom, I it dropped, goes off to the right. Players got to jump, you know. You got to drop down here. Once yeah. you drop, once you drop down here <laughs> and you're coming low 
and you don't care. You just wings, you know, I started winging it in there, but you're right. I I'll never forget Carlos Martinez was coming out there and it's like February after a, a little bit of a rough fall the last year before he had his big year and the cameras came out for the first time with me throwing a ball. And I'll never forget that feeling of like, I felt so, talk about movement, how it's affected by anxiety or thoughts. I felt so stiff, you know, Bard told me this on the podcast. When I asked him, I was like, what was it like when you were at your best and then when you weren't? And he said very simply, he said, Dave, when I was at my best, I wanted everybody to stare at me and say, he was saying to himself, watch what I'm about to do. I mean, if you, if, you know, you remember what his stuff looked like, like who does that 98 miles an hour with that kind of, well, unfortunately some <laughs> more players do do that. But when he was at his worst, he said that it felt like every single person in the whole stadium or wherever on the backfield was staring at him. And that's mm -hmm. like with what you mentioned at the 60 feet, you feel like every body, every eye is on you. Yeah. And, um, and so I totally, you know, not to take it off on a tangent there, but it's a it's a really important point. The yips yeah. are, the yips happen. To yeah, all. Jordan, yeah. yeah, Jordan doesn't have to worry about it because his arm is only good within sixty feet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't go much further him. than that. Everything <laughs> yeah. else that has a natural He's, parachute. He won't he won't move you, but it's like a way no way. People, for the people who are listening, I mean, it, it's there's a lot of anxiety playing catch with a major league player. You know, you, you don't want to move them around. You don't want them to run and you don't want to miss them. You know, Segrist, so, you remember Kevin Segrist? He used to tell me it, like he lived down in Florida. So when I was the only one there in January, Kevin would say, Dave, you mind coming out and just, you know, just walking out. Kevin's a big guy, has GTR there parked in there, walk into one of the fields. And I'm like, I'm not going to say no. I never said no. So I walked out there and he would just expect me to get down there without anything like I'm catching a flat ground. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, and I did it. Um, and I won't tell people what I, what my strategy was. Um, I'll keep it PG 13, but it, it required me to remind myself of the existence of something that I had. And I did it before every time they threw <laughs> and I'm not lying. I literally had to do that cause I was scared, yeah. but, uh, I ended up catching bullpens. So I got that vantage point. I, I, caught when I was, I don't know, 13, 14, I wasn't even particularly good. And I'm catching bullpens, major league, major leaguers. We're talking about like uh Hefner, the Mets pitching coach, one of his, probably one of his last bullpens probably before. I don't know if he played again uh, much after that, but so I got to see that vantage point too. And I think after my time with the Cardinals, Maybe the reason I went so deep into the mental piece than just the data collection, maybe it was because of the fact that I really pushed myself almost more of like a pitching coach, the direction they would go. And one of my best friends was the Cardinals pitching coach, Paul Davis, who's with the Braves now. So I was just, that's what I took to. And I think for me, because of my love of the game, I have this respect for throwing a baseball that I'm going to be very frank with you. If you're going to get in this profession and you're going to be creating throwing programs, you want to use the best technology. You want to be working with companies that have objective data. You want, you want to be with the right people. Don't get me wrong. That is so important. That's why I, I, I'm honored to come on and talk to you guys, but yeah, we're, go ahead. No, sorry to go on. But at the same time, if you're a clinician out there, if you're a professional, or a lower level coach that hasn't even, you know, maybe high school, you have to have a tremendous respect for what, what happens with an elite ball player with that throwing motion, with their level of performance. If you start just throwing things at it, if you just start to try and tweak, that's what you guys were talking about. I mean, this is a special thing that occurs. Throwing a baseball 90 plus miles an hour is one of the most beautiful things. It, it's a special thing that happens. And I think a lot of people out there, unfortunately now, are trying to put out their shiny objects or put their stake in the ground. I think when you have a good product, you can be confident, like this empowers the individual with some uh, you know, usable stuff. But I'd like to see people just shift a little more also towards the respect of, of, of those unknown determinants, of just the beauty of it, the 
the grace of, of what happens with that baseball. And we're still early. And, you know, uh, sorry to go on the soapbox. I think uh, Jordan can talk about this. We've had communications in the past about, you know, when to intervene and what to intervene with. You know, so for, for example, like, you know, Jordan and I, have, you know, we, we've experienced some athletes that the first place that coaches want to go is to change their arm path, you know, and, and, and they, they may not be looking at a more proximal solution, like how they rotate the stability of their trunk positions that they're in, how their lower body moves. But we initially they go right to, or even the timing of the delivery, yeah. you know, coaches might go right to arm path and, and you know, what can happen and it's happened is that you're changing a pitcher so profoundly that two things happen. One, they have brand new soreness patterns. Mm-hmm. And, and two, they have, they, they have command issues because they, they haven't, they haven't had an off season to do it. And sometimes when these things happen in season, it's, it's an issue, you know, and I know through, you know, rehabilitation, um, and, and talking to athletes, a lot of them, owe a lot of their injuries to coaching errors. You know, when you talk to them, you, you ask them, Hey, you sit down with them and say, Hey, can you write down on a sheet? how many adjustments you've made to your delivery in the past two years. And I will tell you, and Jordan can probably attest guys are writing a couple pages where they've been moving on the, on the rubber, where their foot position, their stride angle should be, you know, the, the sink, they got to over hinge. Now another coach doesn't want them to hinge. They get take, they stab the ball out of their glove. Now they take it out and they short arm it. They bring the ball to the ear, you know, now they got to bring their, they draw their arm back. You know, when they land, and, they were heel contact, foot contact. There's, it goes on. And the big thing with that is it never happens with the player that's struggling. Is it always happens with the player that's going really well. That's where the most adjustments happen is those guys that are performing way better than they should be, or they're, you know, have a lot of money assigned to them. They're performing really well. Those are the guys that someone wants to go. I want to be the reason that this guy had a success. So I have to go make an adjustment. And not always, but, you know, a lot of the times the player gets worse. And I like to use the example, you know, Ryan's heard me say it, Bart's heard me say it, is when you put aftermarket parts on a Honda, usually things go okay. When you put aftermarket parts onto a Ferrari, you, it's no longer a usable Ferrari. Right. You know, the, you don't, you don't, those are fine-tuned. Those are highly high-performing machines. And it's the same with a big leaguer. You know, for a player that's that's got that investment and that's already really good, you know, it's it's more risk than reward than it is to go in there and tweak. You know, because if you if you really take, you know, what's a, I, I won't even use a name, but if you if you take player A and he's already performing an above average level, what benefit do you have to make him 0.005 percent better? You know, that's not even going to show up on a on a stat line. That's not going to show up on a return on investment. The only thing that usually happens is that player ends up getting worse and they always go with what is the most easily visible thing. And that's the arm path. And they change the arm path and then some kind of compensation happens with stride angle and then the stride angle changes and a compensation happens with the kinematic sequence. And now David's got a new client. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Like, and, and what I was going to say, like along this process, you know, when we have seen and we, we've been involved in it is that strength, Testing regional strength hasn't been, you know, other than getting a, a biweekly stencil, you know, using dynamometry, it hasn't been at the forefront, you know, where we need, we need to have objective criteria on the distal chain. So your throwing arm is the distal chain. It's kind of the last things that happen for people who are listening to this and they want to know what I'm talking about is that if we can attack weaknesses there, if we can make that a priority, it may give us a better chance that the athlete one adopts the new movement strategy, but two resistant resists their, their ability to strain. The tissues are much stronger. And so that they can handle these new unaccustomed loading um, that they're experiencing. And so, you know, one of the reasons in my previous position as the director of performance integration is that kind of like what you guys have at the Cardinals is we have to take a multifactorial view of coaching an athlete that if we just hone in on we need to make a movement adjustment with this athlete but we don't evaluate their anatomical aspects their physiologic aspects are we setting them up for failure right so that's my piece right there yeah i agree with both of you 
especially with getting that objective number in terms of a strength assessment, because it's not, it's really not used that widely in terms of catering, tailoring the program day to day. It It's time consuming, getting reliability of, of the handheld dynamometry numbers, getting that all done in the training room, whether it's college, the minor leagues, it, I would say it's probably a lower percentage. What I think is important to remember, simply just getting end range strength, even mid range, but especially end range strength numbers, that can tell you a lot in terms of just, you know, Jordan and I, we were talking about the nervous system. Maybe it's a sign of a lot of things, but it's good to have simplicity in the data you're collecting. And I was having a conversation recently with somebody that worked for the works for the Cardinals and actually in a similar in the strength and conditioning side of things. We were talking about as time goes on, it seems like they want to get things more simple or simpler instead of more complex. And I think that's where, when you're looking at the GPS tracking, when you're looking even at a modus sleeve that's looking at valgus and torque and things like that, it's a lot. It's a lot. And because of that, it's it's less powerful, the data. And it's kind of like saying, well, I want to invest my money, so I'm going to find all these really complex instruments to invest my money into those. And without a really targeted approach, it's probably going to just, you know, it's like running your hands through sand versus if you're going to put your money in a few specific types of assets, the mutual fund, whatever, cryptocurrency, you probably have an idea of how you can, you can leverage that. So when you're using technology, what I learned, it was really cool to look at the catapult screen and I didn't have experience with it. So when I was working with Jason, Jason shut there, I guess he's in the big leagues and more of like the bridge physical therapist, performance-based physical therapist. And he was explaining to me, this is, you know, that the peak load at, at the time of the throw, and this is what I'm thinking here. And it's interesting that his peak was so high there, but on that number of throw, his modus sleeve showed an, a slower arm action. And, you know, that's why we think X. That was really awesome and, and kind of like really interesting and, and good critical thinking but in terms of me taking that information, and it's not any knock on him, for me to go use that, that was a really big gap. And it's nice to have things also in, in that process where you can, you can maybe with a strength number at in range, whatever it is, you could play around with that. Maybe you can try a modality or a treatment or the, the athlete can try doing something and then retest and see if there's a change. Even nutrition, maybe they eat lunch and then they come back and they retest. That's what I really like about the simplicity piece of using the of using certain technology. So I think, yeah, that that's my overall feel right now. Yeah, I, I, mean, I agree. It's not about how much data. It's about how much actionable data you have. Yeah. It's got to yeah. be actionable. The thing, the thing that I, you know, it's, it's not really a topic for, for our conversation. We're going to, we're going to put out something on our key metrics because it's something that we discussed internally as a, in our organization and talking about, you know, we need to get, you know, the bluff, like bottom line upfront data, you know, like if, if you, yeah. You're going to give a message to somebody using our our tool like it's got to be right there and you know one of the things that we resonated with is like if you if you give athletes a certain uh range and this happens in biomechanics i've seen some biomechanical reports that put athletes in a, a range that's numerical you know they have to be between 45 and 75 you know you you give them an absolute value you're not going to target everybody because you're going to have athletes that are younger you know, their arm speeds aren't as fast, like all, sure. all these different things that occur. But what we want to do is take a, a normalized approach to strength. And so we have four tests. We have internal rotation, external rotation, scaption, and grip strength. And we want people just at, at the very basis, remember that 20%, so we need to have 20% body weight strength. That's, you know, something that Jordan and I have seen in our experience in terms of athletes that have had problems they have less than 20% body weight strength and uh, in IR and ER. And uh, when it comes to scaption, which is a more disadvantaged position for the shoulder, and we do a three finger grip that's coming out soon, we want 15%. So if, if, if clinicians, coaches, players can get their mind around just that, those basic, you know, uh, key performance metrics, 
I think we got a shot to be really actionable because now we know our training has to reflect it, you know, and I always talk about the conundrum in baseball that we, we tend to test strength and then we try to train it through endurance where we, we hope that, you know, looking at strength as a whole and, and with these numbers, it's going to modify our training to have better recruitment. And for, for us, you know, our tool is isometric Mm -hmm. and we want to be able to, and we know, and you know, in in terms of rehabilitation, isometrics are like the first strength activities to start. Well, there's, so, yeah, you know, so we've, we've created something that I think is now, now not only just a testing piece, but it's an objective training tool that I really think clinicians are going to run with physical therapists, athletic trainers, physicians, people that are in that space are going to really see that, you know, it's a safe method to train and it's quantified. Well, I think the other thing that's important is understanding that there's more to just, there's the, there's the arm care piece. There's the, 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 the program piece to it on top of the assessment piece. And that has been the disconnect that I've seen the, the right program based on some level uh, objective level that's been the biggest disconnect. My sheet, my arm care program, I would do it on level of fatigue. I would have a one or a two or a three, one set, two set, three set uh, RPE. If you're, you know, highly fatigued, then okay, one set. Moderate expected post soreness, okay, two sets. Extreme fatigue, we're going one set. Or if I did, I say that vice versa. Yeah, that's uh, I think okay. I, we got yeah, it. I said that vice versa. <laughs> but um, you know, so. I think that's where even the, I, with the Cardinals, I think I can probably, well, I won't say the details, just out of respect for them. They're, each team, whether it's DNS, which is Dynamic Neuromuscular Stabilization, PRI, Postural Restoration Institute, FMS, Functional Movement System, uh, there's so many, I, FRC, I, I mean, there's the list will go on and on. It's not even worth going through all of them. A lot of the organizations, because of who's at the helm, and they're, 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 you know, their one aspect of evidence-based medicine, which is their experience, their anecdotal experience, which is important, that kind of shades and paints a picture of how to look at the players. And what happens with that then is you do throw some objectivity out the window. And now you're giving your program that's based on a philosophy that, that is not based on the objectivity of, well, we are an organization that uses X technology. And we also have these different philosophies that we we do believe in, but it first comes through the lens of these, this is how we assess our players, or this is the, the technology we use. A lot of these interventions or a lot of these strategies, they're not assessment, they're not really good with their assessments, to be honest with you. Maybe it's better for exercise or just in general, just how to utilize exercise. And you miss the whole entire assessment piece. And I think you should probably pair yourself more with a way to assess and using a technology to assess rather than we believe in this exercise approach. And this is how we assess them based off of that. I think that creates a lot of problems with a lot of organizations. It almost yeah, puts yourself into a corner to where you can't pivot if you need to. Right. You got to make it all work. You got to make, you almost got to fudge the numbers and make it all work for your philosophy rather than, yeah okay, we use a device like you guys have. We use maybe a modus sleeve or something else, whatever it is. And, and then we kind of, we, we figure out what we want to do with that. And I feel like they might do that with the base on the, on the statistics side a little more, but then teams also get typecasted into, they go for certain types of players, things like that. And, you know, it's always that balance of, you got the data scientist person in the performance department, and then you got the, person that's got 30 years of experience as a great manual clinician and, and, you know, a Mike Rhino type of person, maybe that that's just worked with so many ball players. He, you know, has a certain way of treating the athlete or what have you. And it's always that tension between those two pieces, which is good. Uh, But what happens at the lower levels and outside of a, a team setting is there ain't no director of performance. The high school doesn't have it. The college doesn't usually have it either that's where even more so 
what is your objective way of looking at these ball players? You know, that's, that's the solution that we want to be able to bring in. You hit it the nail on the head is that we have to take this high degree of sports science, this high degree of strength and conditioning, you know, this high degree of assessing the neurological condition and make it as easy to do in six minutes, you know, for, for anybody, right. you know, because, because you're talking about a real big problem. I mean, look at major league baseball has, you know, when you look at the high performance stats, they are so big now. They're getting fat. Yeah. Ni- 1985, They're overweight. Yeah. 1985. They had like the athletic therapist did Barry. everything. Barry. Yeah. They, yeah they, <laughs> they trained the athlete. They did, did everything. Now you have like biomechanists, sports scientists, you know, physiologists, there, there's all these, you know, different people added to the equation. And I don't know if it's the social media and the media we're exposed to, but it, it but, you know, also research is pointing to injuries getting worse, you know, they're getting, yeah. they're getting worse with all this support. And what I believe is the problems are happening from the adolescent youth level. We're getting maladaptation, you know, um, they're not being programmed efficiently. Like once, once they get become a professional baseball player, like everything scheduled, they're throwing this much, this many innings. It is so regimented, you know, people get fired if you don't follow a plan with a pitcher. But the problem is nobody until I, I believe our product is put something in the hands of the coaches who do feel responsible for the player's health until now giving them that major league staff in an app as best as possible. You know, what we try to do with education, having people like you on our podcast is giving them more food for thought that will arm them with under, you know, uh, other, other tools to address it. But the, you know, the great thing about the app is that we use data led arm care. You know, we have the objective process and, you know, whatever their deficiencies are, we, we try to remediate it within our app. So at least if coaches might not be knowledgeable what to do with their training, they can, they can really uh, take some relief in knowing that this app is going to be providing this to players, you know, and that's, that's kind of, you know, why Jordan and I, when, when this opportunity came up for us to work for this company, we felt something for this because we have been on the inside and we know how frustrating it is to all this data, all this work, all these people and can't manage the change. But now, you know, is this a problem that's occurring from younger years that we're manifesting and seeing, you know, once they enter professional baseball, that these athletes are getting hurt. You guys are looking at the two things, you know, the range of motion we didn't really talk about. I used to think it was comical when I would just ask, what's the total, what's the T-ROM? What's the total range? Just, just tell me what the total range is at the shoulder. It would be great if you had the spine and stuff. Awesome. But just tell me the shoulder. And a lot of times we weren't even getting that. And I'm like, but we have a lot of strong data on that. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, Kevin and and Mike have done good with that. And they have some strong, I think it's, it's, it's pretty strong, right? Mm-hmm. Where we can make use of that at the very, if you can use that and strength at the lower levels with what you're talking about before they blow up, because I don't believe that players just blow up. You know, if you just look at that, that is going to give you so much. You don't have to have a philosophy. You don't have to have an advanced athletic trainer that knows just baseball or a physical therapist like me. You can be in the field, in the world, take the range of motion and take strength. Don't wait for them to blow up. Don't try and make them a harder thrower. Just take those two things and do the right thing, right? And invest in that that young that young human being. Do the right thing for them. Look at those two things, and imagine how that's going to prevent these. What's this epidemic going on? Why is this happening? It's because we're not taking the time to do that. It's too simplistic. It's oh, too man. easy. <laughs> Listen, after after you said that, I got I got nothing really to say. I mean, if there's a, a stronger endpoint from from kind of bringing it all home. Um, for our listeners, I mean, that is uh, fantastic as far as how to utilize their product and what it can mean, man. And, you know, people are listening to this and hearing it from you. Uh, it just makes the message all the more powerful. It's a great product. And I'm looking forward to utilizing it more and more in the future. 
simple stuff is the way to go. Simple is great because you can use it. Complicated and not understanding it, but looking sexy, nah. Keep driving the Ferrari. I, 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 I want the car that I could actually afford. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David, I, I love everything you're saying here. I know Jordan's going to have to probably jump off in a second, but I did want to, I, I'm curious how you know when a player's ready to return to play. Are there any measurables or anything you're looking for? Um, and, and maybe keeping it simple and doing some of the things we're talking about, but how do you gauge that one at the pro level? And then how would someone at the high school level do the same thing? Bart, great question. And I hate to sell you short on it and tell you that it's, it's, you know, so gray, but I think what we did really good in professional baseball, Ryan, I know you, you saw this, you, cr you control the variables and you have so many different steps of the process. And we all hear the stories when I was just interviewing a player. Uh, I won't say his name, but you'll probably figure out who he is when the podcast drops. And he had the, he had a surgery that was quite new in the big leagues in his elbow. And it wasn't a reconstruction, something else. Again, I'll be cognizant of, of protecting health information, but you could figure all, all of it out. They just started doing the, these and he felt that, you know, things went a little quick in the, the return process in terms of single A, double A, triple A, back to the, whatever it is. That's what overall we usually did really well. There was always those few cases where it didn't go great. And that's what's really difficult to do in the, in the scholastic levels. You don't have a spring training complex. You don't have a farm system. So the, the short answer is you want it to be so seamless and have so many steps. And it's not about slowing people down, let them go through that process as quickly as they can, but try not to miss those steps. And I think that's what I'm noticing, especially working more with youth players nowadays. It's, let me just get back to the game. And I'm like, well, let's define the steps of that game and the levels of that game. And they don't have the resources to do it. So for the people out there, try and set that up yourself. Try and fill in the gaps of those steps and try not to miss them. Even if it's just one outing, one day, on a flat ground, whatever it is, try not to miss those pieces. That that's part, you know, what I thought was the the best way to ensure a player was ready for that level. Make sure that they did the level before that. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I and I totally see it. I mean, I've got kids who are high school age, and it's either you're either out or you're in at full capacity, and and there is no in between. It's tough. And, yeah. It's Fantastic. A good question. Well, this has been awesome. I don't know um, if you've got any last things. I, I'm definitely going to put all your links in the show notes. Definitely Appreciate check it. out David Meyer and, and what he's doing. Um, check out his book. Uh, you know, it's always good to hear, talk to people who've got, you know, unique perspectives and the experience and want and want to share that um, no matter at what level you are with your dreams of baseball or, or whatever it is. Um, any last parting uh, words before we take off? I would just encourage everybody to take a chance and, and try a technology out there that's going to give you some of the data we talked about that's simple and really, you know, I, 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 I'm a big fan of crossover, actually, funny enough, because I always, whenever my patients are asking me, hey, what band should I use? I'm like, you know, honestly, I got really spoiled. I just use really one. When I was working for the cards, we had them. When I was at HSS, wherever, it was always crossover, excuse me, it was always crossover symmetry. And so, you know, I, I just, I think it's important to utilize something that makes sense to you. I think that's where the strength stuff comes into play, the range of motion and the system you have to take it yourself. My whole entire book, it, the, the subtitle of my book is a guide to empowering yourself to transform your life after injury. The key, the operative part of that is empowering yourself. Yep. And so your technology really does do that. And I would say, you know, see what else is out there for sure. You always want to test different things out, but just ask yourself, does this really empower me? Does it empower the person that is working with me? Does it really empower me? Can I do this on my own? So I'll leave people with that. Fantastic. This was, a, this was awesome. I appreciate it. Everybody, like I said, check out the show notes and until next time, take care.